Good morning, everybody. Good morning, sister. Wishing you a happy Sabbath. And we are asking those who are from the outside to come in because we're going to start our song service. What number? 394. Um, shall we stand forward or pray? That is full of prayer. Look at you now. Full of prayer. Full of prayer. Okay. Shall we bow our heads? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day of rest. We thank you for protecting us during the six days of toil and of labor. And as we come to worship you and sing praise to your name, we ask you please to anoint us with thy Holy Spirit. Fill us, we pray, O oh God, and help us as we worship you, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless each and every one of us and those who are out uh, at the home, those who are listening on the line, I pray that you'll bless them also and help us to spend a wonderful Sabbath in your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. We'll turn to our hymnals to sing number 314, 394. Far from all care, we hail the Sabbath morning. <coughs> Far from all care, we hail the Sabbath morning. Oh, well, in fields heard from the distant sea. Swear Number two, all preachers of our Lord and King. All creatures of our Lord and King, lift up a voice and step and see.
opening song, we'll turn to number 15. My maker and my king, to thee my all I own. My maker and my king, to We reverently seek the Lord in prayer. Eternal and Heavenly Father, we thank thee for sparing our lives during the past six days and has brought us into your house of worship, where we can continue to give the thanks and praise that is due to the most holy name. Lord, we ask for forgiveness where we have sinned against you in thought, word, and action. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. At this time, Lord, we pray, remember the sick wherever they are. We ask that you pass your hands upon each and every one of them. We ask of thee, Lord, also those who are on the street, those without home, without shelter, without food, Lord, remember them at this time. At this time, Lord, also, we pray for those who have been the, how we say that they are, they are sick, sick physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, Lord. Lord, we ask of thee that you be with each and every one of them, Lord. And at this time, Lord, we remember the superintendent is about to take the program. We ask of that you send the Holy Spirit to be upon her and help her that all that she said and done by the abuse of drawing someone nearer closer to thee. 
We ask that continue to be rest of the program. We ask for those who are late, we ask that you quicken their footsteps. And finally, when time shall be no more, save us in your kingdom, since we ask all these mercies in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Lord answers pray in the morning. Lord answers pray at noon. Lord answers pray in the evening. So keep your hearts in Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath to all. Special good morning to our visiting friend. I tired of even inviting a friend, and today she make me a surprise. But it's a pity the family is not there. She's alone. Welcome, Janelle. W, what a friend we have in Jesus. E, early in the morning when I rise. L, leading on the everlasting light. 
see, come he that love the Lord. Oh, oh brother, be faithful, soon Jesus will come. M, my maker and our King Jesus. Welcome one, welcome all in the house of the Lord. As a special welcome to our viewers, especially for Sister Edmure. So welcome on, welcome all. Again, I say, I bid you a hearty welcome. Good morning, Sabbath School members and visiting friends. We are happy that you are with us and you will enjoy that blessed Sabbath morning together. Brethren, it's a joy to be in the house of the Lord. We are happy and those who have been part participated, I bless, I know God will bless you and we give you thanks. Today, this Sabbath is in um, improvement. A Sabbath of, of improvement. When we heard the word improvement, brethren, what comes in mind? What comes in mind is to grow, is to add, is to put value and change. Take stock. What um, COVID-19 have done to you? I want to ask the question this morning. What COVID-19 has done to us? Has COVID-19 put us to sit and take stock in our lives? Or COVID-19 have us to sit and relax and say, okay, that's life. You have been said there will be a lot of pestilence, problems, and all these things. And so, that is life. Is it the way we looked at COVID-19? We don't know what COVID-19 is. But we know God is speaking to us. Awake, shine. When Adam, when God created Adam at creation, he placed everything by tools, a male and a female. Adam is made, and God says to Adam, name all of them. All the names that we are getting, or we know, is Adam who named all of them. But look, there is a pair. But Adam has that job to call each by name. So when mine to name, something is missing. So that thing missing, God seed put that desire to see there's something it has to be missed. The scripture says, when the man leave his father and mother and join to his wife, they are one, they become one. So that thing is God who put it into man. Okay? That's one thing. You go home and digest it, think of it, how God has created everything in order. Nothing chock and block. With God, everything was set, well planned. That is creation. He had to meet with um, Moses. Moses carried his father in law's sheep. He was the shepherd taking care of it. God called him by burning bush. Moses turned to see what is happening. I seen bush burning, I not seen nothing, you know. Um, Going further. But God says to, uh, um, to Moses, the place you are standing is holy ground. 
Reverend, I say all that to say, we have been organized before. Here is not the first place we sit and worship. When we walked in here to come to worship, what's in our mind? Who are we meeting with? How are we looking at this time we sit here? What's in our mind? What are we thinking? What is our desire? What is our purpose of coming to church? That is the question we have to ask ourselves. Are we progressing? Are we satisfied with our Christian life? During the week, how we deal with the person next to us? Our children, our husband, when Sabbath comes, sometimes we, we, we misbehave badly. But when Sabbath comes, we sit. Um, don't forget the Sabbath the Lord our God has made. But your husband by you, your child by you, the neighbor hearing you, you pray, and it's okay. Should that be the way to live for that time we are living in? Are we satisfied? These are the questions. But remember, we have to give an account. We have to give an account in the time which we are living in. Brethren, sisters, we, there's something ahead of us is preparing. If we are not grounded and rooted, if we're taking life easily, relaxing, feeling everything is all right, we'll be in danger. We have to have our eyes open, our mind open open steadfastly not to be satisfied in the time which we are living because the devil never satisfied not one moment he will sit and say everything okay I have done like Paul says I have fought, fight a good fight I have finished my course he would never say that he will always be on an attack if he cannot get us, he will get our children. If he cannot get our children, he will get our husband. If he cannot get our neighbors, our working place, the devil will not give up. Now, we ourselves, we mustn't sit and say it is okay. It is not okay. It is not okay. God give us his word. He said we have to have our eyes open. Let us turn to our, our uh, 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 a little scripture words I want to leave with you. Romans 13, 11, and 14. Turn to your Bible. Romans 13, 11 to 14. have it? Romans 11, chapter, chapter 13, excuse me, chapter 13, verse 11 to 14. Let us read. He said, for the, okay, just now, eh? Romans 11, excuse me. Right, 11, Romans, Romans 13, sorry, Romans 13, 11, and knowing that, knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Some of us has been there 30 years, some of us has been walking that road for 20, some a year. But at any time we, we started it, Christ is nearer to us. Okay? Then when we believe, the night is far spent, 
the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the work of darkness and let us put on the armor of light, which is Christ. Let us walk humbly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in trembling and wantonness, not in strife and envying, put, but put on, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You see, that flesh, that me, that me, God is saying to us, we have to have that die that you can walk the walk and talk the talk. When we come here, we come to worship God. When we come here, we come in the house of the Lord. God says to Moses, take off your shoe because the place you stand right now is holy. So brethren, when we come in the house of the Lord, we come to worship God. We come to meet up with him. We come to give him praise. Now it shows the way we live through the week. That's the way we come to church. So let us put off the work of the flesh and put on Jesus Christ, who is the source and our creator and our hope of glory, that when he comes, none of us will be, not be, de be deceived because the devil is like a roaring lion and seeking whom he may devour, knowing that the time which we are living right now, there's people from the church itself who are plucked in up, living the faith which they have known from the beginning and branch off. Brethren, they are your brother, they are your sisters. They can come to you and talk to you and give you nice words, but you have to be careful. Christ says we must not be deceived, steadfast and unmovable. May the Lord bless us and keep us as we journey through eternity. Ready? Good morning, church. I am here to have your help so that we can discuss the lesson. Um, the desire of all nations, but I need the help of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. We give thee thanks and praise, O God, unto your most holy name. Through the Holy Spirit, you have promised to teach, to guide, and instruct us in the truth as it is in Jesus. We need your help, and we need the on the. We need the, your help that each and every one of us that are listening, wherever we may be, may open our hearts to truth because truth has fallen in the street and we desire to know you. Whom is to know is likely to know. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I want to say that from the time we come to earth, we are in a deplorable condition because the devil has hold us captive. And this is the reason why the lesson this morning will help us to realize how God is the desire of all nations. Because the Bible says all have sinned. Whatever language, whatever color, whatever nationality you are, God is supposed to be your desire. And we must understand, when we come to earth, we came in our situation. And if we want deliverance, where will we go to find deliverance for our soul? When people need medication, 
they go to the pharmacy or the drugstore. When people need groceries, they go to the supermarket, isn't it? So when you want deliverance for your soul, where do you go? So this morning we realize, or oh, the Lord will teach us the reason why he is our only hope. Sabbath lesson, in a nutshell, is just helping us to know the gospel is not about what we can do, but what God can do for us. It is saying that many believe they have something to give to God so that they can be acceptable or be forgiven. But many of us has to understand that it is by grace we are saved and not of ourselves. These are things we know Adventists, but the many people that believe wherever they are hearing me, thinking that they have something to add so that God will love them or God will forgive them, they are making a big mistake because salvation is something that God gives freely because of his grace. Sunday's lesson, the effect of sin. If anyone has something to say, you're, you're welcome. Sunday's lesson, the effect of sin. We cannot miss it, people. When we look around us, we can see the effects of sin, not only in the world, but also in our lives. Christ came to save us from our sins. He wants to give us complete victory, his righteousness. I'm hearing many times people talk about my goodness, how good I am, and how righteous I am. Many times I hear people turn things and say it has some spirituality in it. But I'm saying to myself, where do they get that from? What, man, what spirituality do man possess in themselves? All this is God's prerogative. God is spirit. And if we want to have some spiritual life, we need to be connected with God. Many people does not understand righteousness by faith. If God is righteous, and we are his people, and he has come to give us righteousness, how are we going to get it? Yes? Do you have something? Let me ask, let me ask that question. When Adam sinned, no, before I say that, Adam and God had a wonderful thing going on between them because he was covered with his righteousness, right? So what happened when Adam sinned? Why wasn't Adam, um, why wasn't Adam's relationship with God was the same? Yes, sin has separated us from God because Adam went and hide. He could not stand in God's presence at that moment because he was feeling so much separated from him. Now, do you see what is going on with us ourselves? The effect of sin is so powerful. Um, so the effect of sin causes us to be rebellious against God's government. Yes? Yes.
nice in your uniform. Okay. The reason righteousness by faith, righteousness is by faith for us, but it wasn't like that for Adam, exactly. is because Adam had a face-to-face -face relationship with God. They talked with each other. God walked in the garden. God touched him, put him to sleep, took a rib out of him. All right? The baby, the baby is agreeing with me. All right? What I'm saying is touching us so much, he's crying. Adam had that face-to-face, -face, but when Adam sinned, that face-to-face -face relationship with God had to end because now the face of Adam is, and man is contaminated with sin. Amen. But God still wants that relationship with man, but he cannot have it face-to-face. -face. It has to be face-to-face. -face. Not face-to-face, -face, but faith. To face so we could we could approach God but not face to face anymore but it has to be now by faith and that faith to face relationship with the Lord is what a, what will accord to us account to us his righteousness that Adam had when he had a face to face relationship with him so Amen. that's why faith is important for righteousness. Amen. Okay. Um, okay. The effect of sin have us to be rebel to be to rebel against God's government. Um, sin causes us to deny the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And if we look into Matthew chapter 12, 13, 31, 32, it says that all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven to men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven because the Holy Spirit is the only medium that will help sinful human beings to see their state. He's the only one that will be able to convict men of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. So you see, because of the effects of sin, man can no longer understand what's good and what's evil. They can no longer understand what is pure and what is impure. So we need the, the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can come back face to face with our Lord Jesus. Yes. My question is still concerning the lesson. Why is it that God is um, having vengeance? What the vengeance is about? Is it like us or? Thank you. Um, that was that is first day's lesson, huh? Okay. Uh. Only the Lord has the authority and the purity to have vengeance against Satan and against sin. Because sin is an act only against God. We do wrong to each other, but we can't sin against each other. Because sin is one thing and one thing alone with God. But sin changes when it comes to us. Because I might say this thing is a sin, and then tomorrow I change my mind. Homosexuality was a sin a few years ago, now it's fine. But with God, sin remains, which is why it's only an act against him. So... This vengeance that God has, it is his wrath against sin and Satan. It's not, it was not geared against man. But Jesus says, the fires of hell were prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, if you're found collaborating with them, then God will have no choice. The vengeance that will come against 
Satan and sin, you will end up being part and parcel of that because you have absorbed or you have remained in your sin. There, whatever God does, he does it in love. Even hell is in love. So you have to say, thank God for hell because if God did not have hell planned, <laughs> man would live eternally in sin. Whatever God does, it's never outside of his supreme love. It's always within his supreme love. You see, it's like when the Bible says God is a jealous God. We cannot understand the jealousy of God with our jealousy. Our jealousy is contaminated with sin. We're going to kill the man who, 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 who come in after our girl. The jealousy of God is not contaminated with sin. He wants us for himself and himself alone and no other God. Yes. Amen. That's love. Even his vengeance is in love. In other words, God don't sit down and plan to kill you. <laughs> Man's vengeance is, I got bossy head tomorrow. God's, God's vengeance is not that. God's vengeance is like this. I want to destroy Satan so I could save that man. I want to save that man from sin. The best way God could take vengeance against Satan is to save us. Because the wages of sin is death. Yeah, kill, get, get rid of him. Burn him up. Charcoal. He loves us so much that he don't want us to go through all this pain and this suffering because of our sin because we'll be miserable if he takes us to heaven. So because of that, he has to destroy us. That is for our own good, just as he took out the tree of life from the garden. Well, to round up, because the time is up, the, um, Isaiah 59 says, God's hand is not too short to save us, nor his ears cannot hear. So take note and understand that if we are not in the condition that we are supposed to, as God wants to bless us and save us, it is because we remain in our sins and it separates us and prevents God from blessing us as he has meant to be. So I'm encouraging us to accept God's righteousness and be faithful until the end. I want to thank everyone who has been participated in the Sabbath school this morning. May the good Lord bless us and keep us and see us through and set our mind upwardly that when Christ or death come in suddenly now, brethren, sometimes you hear that person just fall, not feeling too well, and right away, Death is at hand to that person. Christ comes to that person. So let us live in preparation for the time that is ahead of us. May the good Lord bless us. In our closing for the conclusion of the Sabbath school, we call now um, the chorister. We do in number 34. Wake the song of joy and gladness. Let's all stand. 34. Let's, on, let's all stand to sing that wonderful song. Wake the song of joy and gladness. Wake, Wake the song of joy and gladness. He the free, your noblest name. Vanish every thought and i
as in Savo. This is Ed. Okay, if we continue our song service, we will turn to our hymnals and sing number 27, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. Rejoice it pure Good morning, brothers and sisters. You're welcome in the house of the Lord. Um, the scripture reading is taken from Matthew chapter 15, verse 25. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Scripture reading. Our mighty, everlasting Father who art in heaven. At this moment, dear Lord, we, thy believing children, come before thee. Nothing good we bring before thee, dear Lord, but sin and shame. We are not worthy to come before thee. But because of your grace, your son, which you have sent to die on the cross of Calvary for us, we can have this grace, but we ought to, dear Lord, do what you ask, so that this grace can be given unto us graciously. So we thank you for forgiving us, cleansing us without any vain, and creating us a clean heart and a right spirit, that as we worship this morning, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray in a Marcus special way for the one appointed, dear Lord, to bring the message, the good news unto us, and even those who are around the world listening to us today. Help, dear Lord, that this message may do wondrous things on our hearts that we may be transformed, and that, dear Lord, we may be called sons and daughters of you till you come. Continue with us this way. Bless us throughout the day. Bless all our brothers and sisters worldwide, for we have asked all these mercies, not because we are worthy of anything, but we have asked all in Jesus' name. Amen. from Psalms 24 and this one. A well-done text. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell there. The deacon will now wait on us for the tithe, offering, and special number 639 639 a diligent and grateful heart prompts me to
ID abroad and sisters, dear young people, good morning. It's always a pleasure to be with you guys. I enjoy to be with you every time they invited me. Today is still a day of joy for me. But it is also a day of sadness. Today is a day of joy because we have entered into the Sabbath of the Lord. Somebody say amen. Somebody say hallelujah. Sabbath is a day of joy where heaven and earth merge to give glory and honor to the Creator. Sabbath is also a day where we rediscover who is this wonderful God who cares for us and provides for all our need according to his riches in Jesus' name. Let us stand, brothers and sisters, and sing to the glory of God. Let us celebrate the Sabbath, singing this little song which we all know. Sabbath is a happy day. Let us sing, brothers and sisters, dear young people, with joy to the glory of our God. Sabbath is a happy day, happy day, happy day. Sabbath is a happy day. I love every Sabbath. Sabbath is a happy day, happy day, happy day. Sabbath is a happy day. I love every Sabbath. Okay, well, it seems that you're not happy. Let's sing that more. All right. Okay? We are happy because today is a happy day. We sing that more lustily. Okay, let's start again. Sabbath is a happy day, happy day, happy day. Sabbath is a happy day. I love every Sabbath. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. As true as it is, that Sabbath is a very wonderful day. It is also true that today is a sad day for me. This Sabbath, brothers and sisters, is the 26th Sabbath that my family and I go without our oldest daughter, Rod Shama. It is hard. I assure you. And God only, God only know I am standing before you this morning. The year 2020, it is true, brought us along with its COVID-19 and its dengue epidemic, so much pain and suffering. But I want to remember I want to remember in agreement with Jeremiah the prophet as I go forward in 2021 that the mercy of the Lord, amen, the mercy of the Lord are not exhausted. This is brothers and sisters, dear young people, what I want to go over in my heart, what will give me hope. The mercy of the Lord are not exhausted. His mercy are not at an end. They are renewed every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, over all the earth. I declare this morning, brothers and sisters, praise be the name of the Lord. Praise be his name among us in 2021. From now and forever on. For the year 2020, despite the pain and the soul experiencing, may the name of the Lord be glorified. 
it's still hard for me when I think about her, but the Lord is still good. Our reflection today is boldly titled, Even Dogs Have Rights. Even Dogs Have Rights. And our basic text for this reflection is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 25 to 28. The Bible says, But she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered and said, It is not good. To take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. But she said, yes, Lord. For even the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Let us pray. Heavenly merciful Father, talk to us once again. Your servant is listening. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I want to begin this reflection from a biblical and historical point of view. You must understand, brothers and sisters, dear young people, that through biblical history, there has been a strict division between Jews and the Gentile of Judah. These two groups of people were different in their cultural practices, religious practices, and social custom. The Gentile on one and the one side were struck off from the church and considered as secular. They did not have the privilege, the privileges and advantages that Jewish society enjoy. The Jew, on the other hand, have always wanted to be recognized as a special group of people and different from others. The Jew, in fact, didn't like at all the Gentile. And the most odious crime were imputed to the Gentile. They were not considered to be important in society. Their contribution to the social life of the nation had no value. A Gentile, by birth, was considered as unclean. Ellen White, in the book, dedicated to Jesus Christ on page 3, 9 and 3, says, The wall of separation erected by Jewish pride even prevented the disciple from feeling sympathy for the pagan world. The Jewish society had no respect for the Gentile. They were not even considered to be people. The Gentiles were commonly called dogs, which indicated their place and their role in Judean society. Today, brothers and sisters, young people, the world has evolved. I must recognize it. But the mentality the uses and cost of remain the same. As the wise man Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9, that which has been is what will be, and that which has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. In this modern society, in this modern generation, where we live today, many obstacles have been created. Obstacles that prevent some individual 
from being considered equal. Martin Luther King fought all his life against racial segregation and societal barrier. Malcolm X, icon of the struggle for African American rights, fought for racial discrimination to be abolished in the United States. Mahatma Gandhi, great defender of human rights, fought also for the right of poor people, regardless of color, to be recognized. And more recently, Barack Obama, during his presidential mandate, fought for the same cause, even if it was never mentioned by him, but for the world world, it was a broken barrier. Today, in our modern society, as in the day of the Jew, in Jesus' time, individuals are punished because of their race, their sex, or even their religion. Even among Christians, no, that is not happening here. Am I right? That is not happening here. Even among the church, may God have mercy upon us. Even among us, brothers and sisters, gathered here this morning, there is a level of stereotype hidden in the shadow of hypocrisy. Are we better? Are we better than others because of our various achievements? Or are we afraid to admit that we are like everybody and that we wanted to be like the Jew to recognize as a special people? Today in our modern society, the rich cannot wear jeans and t-shirt at work because he is afraid, afraid of being considered as an equal. He must be set apart from others. This attitude, brothers and sisters, dear young people, has overwhelmed our society and our churches today to such an extent that children from their very youngest age learn to abstain love and play in school with a particular group of individuals. Jesus, brothers and sisters, dear young people, Jesus is the author of love. Love that transcends our imagination. He is the personification of love. His action and act cannot call into question his ability to love and express his love to everybody. Because the Bible says everywhere he goes, he was showing love. Jesus presented love as the greatest gift anyone can have. He showed that love is not limited to one race, gender, status in society strata. I declare this morning, brothers and sisters, love in his most pure form is Jesus Christ. I declare this morning that love in its most pure form is Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, the possibility of having real love does not exist. I am tempted to refer to Jesus' question to Peter during his last meeting with the disciples after his resurrection. In the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John, verse 15 to 17, Jesus questioned Peter, saying, Simon, son of John, Jonah, 
do you love me more than these? He answered him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lamb. He said to him the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? Peter answered him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? The Bible says that Peter was grieved. That he said to him for the third time, do you love me? And he answered him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Jesus asked him the question three times. Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? Understand this morning, brothers and sisters, dear young people, that the reason why Jesus asked the question three times to Peter was not mainly because Peter did not show love to Jesus, but because he wanted Peter to be able to show the same love to others, more precisely to the Gentile. If Peter loved Jesus, then he would be able to show the same love to his sheep. Regardless of their religious affiliation, race, or social status. Very often, we are called to bear witness to and to manifest our love for one another in relation to the fact that we are a member of the body of Christ. But the question is, what happened to us when the people who must respect the law of Christ's love, treat us like the Gentile of all time. What happened to us when the people who must respect the law of Christ's love treat us like the Gentile of all time? What are we supposed to feel? In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 21 to 28, Christ, who taught the principle of love, met a Canaanite woman on the shore of Tyre and Sidon. Matthew reports the fact, says in verse 21 to 28, that Jesus departed from there and retire into the territory of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman coming from these countries cried unto him, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly tormented by the demon. He did not answer her a word. And his disciple come near and said to him earnestly, send her away, for she is crying behind us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost ship of the house of Israel. But she came and bowed down to him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, great is thy faith. Let it be done as you want. And that very hour, her daughter was healed. 
We are here, brothers and sisters, dear young people, in Matthew 15, verse 21 to 28, right in the cultural culture, context of, sorry, we are right here in the cultural context outlined in the introduction to our reflection. Let us now understand well what is happening here in Matthew 15. The Bible said that the daughter of a Canaanite woman is tormented by a demon and she need urgent attention. She called out to Jesus, the father of love. She called out in a clear and precise term, demonstrating that by this that she recognized in Jesus the promised Messiah to Israel. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is clearly tormented by the demon. But Matthew tells us that Christ seems not to pay attention to her request. He did not answer her a word. The disciple saying that. The disciple approached Jesus and said to him earnestly, send her away, for she is crying behind us. In other words, she is drawing attention on us. Shut up. This is not happening here. I believe that. Lord of mercy. At the request of the disciple, Jesus will turn to her, to this Canaanite woman. And in verse 24, he will say, I was sent only to the lordship of the house of Israel. Being a Canaanite woman, she is used to being rejected, left over, and denigrated by the Jews. But she is ready now. She is ready to do anything for the healing of her daughter. She will accept her position within a society which does not want her. She is going to humble herself and bow down at the feet of Christ. And with insistence, she will say with a crented heart, the head turned to the ground, Lord, help me. And Jesus is going to answer in verse 26. And his answer, I believe, is an answer that none of us present here this morning would like to hear from the Lord of Lord. He replied in verse 26, it is not well to take the bread of the children and throw it to the little dogs. Although it was not the intention of Jesus, I have to admit, brothers and sisters, and tell you that this answer is not only offensive, but it is humiliating and disparaging. It is not well to take the breads of the children and to throw it to the little dog. I admire the persistence and the patience of the woman. When we look at this story, we realize that wounded, humiliated, and brought down to the lowest level, she will swallow her pride, bow down in adoration at the feet of the master, and recognize the truthfulness of his declaration. Yes, Lord, she said. In other words, it is true what you just said. But, a 
Hallelujah. The little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master table. She recognized Jesus as her master, despite this heartful declaration. And Jesus, in front of such a declaration of love and dedication, could not remain unmoved. In verse 28, Jesus said to her, Woman, woman, thy faith is great. Let it be done to you as you want. And the Bible said that at that very hour, her daughter was healed. Even though today, dogs in other contexts, for example, in a youth circle, even though today dogs may mean friend, group of friends, best friend, or boss, in our modern society, calling a person a dog is literally, in a literal sense, mean that he is inferior. Can you realize I will come to my dad here and say, Dad, what you are saying is not true. You are acting like a dog. What you will say? You will say, what is happening to the pastor? He's losing his mind. Pastor, you cannot say that. What is happening to you? Calling someone dogs in our society means that he is inferior. That he is at the lower level of society. That means that he is not ready to be cited. But let us be assured that in our story, Jesus did not say that the Canaanite woman, woman sorry, was not ready. He was about in that context, he was about to use her to teach. He was about to use her to teach perhaps one of the most profound lessons in, of his ministry. A lesson which, if applied today, will increase the number of Christians we have in the world and brought down many social barriers that still exist in our day. You know, often, individuals who are excluded from social circles and who are excluded from equal treatment, they remain hidden from the world because they lack self-esteem and motivation to approach those who belong to the higher class in society. Jesus, although he was humble, was of Jewish descent, which automatically made him a middle class citizen. That means that he was well above the Canaanites. In our day, a Gentile, a Gentile represents a person struggling with religious and national difficulty. Today, in our day, in our modern society, the COVID-19, the COVID-19 has showed us that with, if, sorry, a good guy was struck by lightning or an epidemic, they would probably not be treated with as much urgency as a high-class citizen would. That's the sad reality. In Matthew 15, verse 21 to 28, Jesus, brothers and sisters, dear young people, felt the need to show without going through the Jewish protocol of selection that this Canaanite woman was different from others. Although he refused to answer her, 
on her first request for help in verse 20, 23, I believe that Jesus knew. He knew that she was really looking for the master. But everyone around don't know, didn't know that. The perseverance of this Canaanite woman is worthy to be mentioned. Because it's revealed that even if we are all different, right, black, yellow, brown, or fair skin, we all deserve the help of the master. Not because of our merit, because, but because of his bloodshed for mankind on Calvary 2,000 years ago. Yes, on Calvary cross, Christ redeemed us at the cost of his blood. And today, whether we are right or black, of French nationality, German, English, Greek, Jewish, whatever, in the eyes of the Lord, we are in the same boat. We are all sinners saved by grace. In this story, Jesus, in his love and mercy, treated the Canaanite woman with the same love he treated his Jewish disciple. He demonstrated that the grace of God is not limited to a single group of people because his grace cover the whole world and the perimeter of his love is vast and unlimited. Jesus, by exposing the faith of this Canaanite woman in public, broke one of the racial barriers established by the Jew. Even his disciple was astonished. But the question that rises today is the following. Where does this apply in today's postmodern era? Which is a time filled with the trenches idea and philosophy on ethics, an era separated by wealth and politics. Our modern society have to be changed. We are living in an era separated by wealth and politics. And our modern society, our modern era, as in Jesus' time, brothers and sisters, is tempted by intense stereotypes, which have led many people, especially the young people, to gang violence and drug abuse. When we look at young people today, in the street, and even in the church, we realize that they are not motivated to move forward. You know why? Simply because society and the church, as in Jesus' time, stereotype them as unsuitable for progress. And this worldly state of mind, brothers and sisters, dear young people, seems to be creeping into the church little by little. The church today seems to be under the seductive power of the world mentality. Today, when in the church, those who are the most esteemed and at the higher practice sin and are not disciplined, we demonstrate by that, we are distinguishing between people. When in the church, brothers and sisters, only the financially stable become 
the first elders, year after year, we thereby demonstrate that we are making a statutory distinction. When the program of young people are attended so little, we demonstrate by that we are making a generational distinction. We have come today to a point where even in the church, God have mercy on us. We make distinction and put people down. It's hard to say that. Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, verse 25 to 26, the kings of nations rule over them and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactor. Let it not be the same with you, but let the greatest among you be like the smallest and the one who rules like the one who serves. God of mercy on our own justice. Considering today, today's society and the church, in the light of the Canaanite Roman story, one could ask the question, who are the master? And who are the dogs? Paul said, that we are all on the scene. We are all on the scene. We are not better than anyone. As the church, as the church fully understood this concept, have we, brothers and sisters, accepted the fact that when we meet Christ, we are all transformed in the image of and in his likeness. I declare this morning that our society today and our churches can never be united until they understand that all race and sexes are equal before God and that we are all coming out the hand of the creator. We are all brothers and sisters. Christ, when he was on earth, did everything to break down generational and statutory racial barrier. With the example of this Canaanite woman. But today, we are reconstructing them with our own example. Instead of encouraging godliness, through selfless services in the world and in the church, we are encouraging humiliation and segregation through selfishness. This behavior has become a widely phenomenon and today it is even creeping in the church. Is there hope? The answer is yes. There is still hope in Jesus. And building on that hope is what we need to focus on. Just as the Canaanite woman, by her persistence, stepped into the power of God, we too must persist in obtaining the power of the Holy Ghost. Let us understand this morning, brothers and sisters, that to, that to express the grace and the favor of Christ does not depend on those around us. It depends on our hung hunger for Christ. If the Canaanite woman had depended on those around her, she would have left home. She would have left the presence of the master without her blessing. We must not depend on everyone around us to influence our relationship with God. We must depend on God and God alone. Jesus said in Matthew 7 verse 21, 
Those who said to me, Lord, Lord, will not all enter the kingdom of heaven, but he alone who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. All those who cry to the Lord will not enter heaven. It's sad. But it is true. All those who call Lord will not enter the kingdom of God. But only those who have a solid relationship with Jesus Christ. Even dogs have rights. Those who are de degraded, degraded, I'm sorry, and excluded not only in society, but also in the church, have right. They have right. They have the right to receive Jesus. They have the right to call for forgiveness. They have the right to preach Jesus. And they have the right to be with Jesus. We all have right. We cannot limit ourselves to the unfortunate condition in which we may have been classified due to our bloodline or our own mystic. However, we are fortunate that Christ is still reaching out to us today to offer us peace, love, joy, and redemption. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, right? Before God, before God, we come from his hand. And because we come from his hand, we are all ready to be saved. Because of the blood of Christ, who have been shed on Calvary Cross. The color of our skin, Grandpa, does not matter before God. The color of our skin does not matter before God. Our race, young people, does not matter before God. Our position in the world, young girl, does not matter before God. What matters is where we are going. And let me tell you something, young people. Don't let anybody put you down. Because you are a child. You are a <laughs> Lord of mercy. You are a child of God. And nobody can put you down. Because Jesus died on Calvary cross. So that you may be lifted up to the kingdom of God. What matter is where we are going. In this battle that we wage every day, God is our comforter. When I think that I can't go through it, he consoles me. The Bible says that he is my hope. He is my hope in this world. He is my joy of living. He is my peace in the midst of the storm. The Bible tells me that he is my doctor when I face diseases. He is the one who supports me on the word of life. Yes, he is the one who gives me wisdom. He is my advisor when I face problems in my life. He is my friend and my father. He is my confidant. He is the one who provides for all my needs. He is the one who organizes my life and protects me. Yes, I am a sinner. But, hallelujah. I am a sinner saved by the wonderful grace of God. So let us place our hope in him. For our salvation and trust him for our future. Jesus, brothers and sisters, dear young people, Jesus is standing beside us. Let us hold on, on him, to him, and move forward without 
discrimination between us toward eternity for tithes are numbered. As I bring to a hand this reflection, I received from the Lord the order to pray with those who want to cling to the Lord in order to receive the strength to advance toward eternity. In the name of the Lord, I invite all those who want to receive the strength from God advance toward eternity to raise their hand and to stand up on their feet as we pray our God. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning because we recognize once again your love toward us. We thank you for everything you have done for we, for, we, for us on Calvary Cross. We thank you for the blood of Christ that has been shed to cleanse us today. As we recognize our need for salvation, we humbly pray, pray that you may come in our life and change our mind, change our way of thinking, and let us become the woman, the man, the children, the pastor, the elder, the person who, who want us to be. May your spirit in us cleanse us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Almighty bless each every one of us. It is my prayer for you and for me. Amen.